The countdown is on. First to an Eagles Cowboy. Huge. Mega. It's Cowboy Week. Or is it? Well, that's one of the things we'll discuss today. And, of course, down the road, the Eagles getting into the playoffs. Jody Mack here with you. Jeff Kerr sitting in the co-host chair uh, this morning. It's been a minute, Mr. Kerr. How are the holidays? They treat you well enough? Uh, they were okay, Jody. I won't go into too much detail, but it, it, they were okay. It's I'll say this. I couldn't wait for December to be over for multiple reasons, but it was you – know, at least the Eagles got me through it. I, I'll say that. The Eagles in the NFL, it, it made the month go quicker than it should have been. And the Eagles making the playoffs has gotten a lot of people through the end of the year. As we turn the page on to 2022, John McMullen, my usual partner, going to do the guest thing today. And as I just tweeted out, I have some concerns that the Eagles, who successfully gamed the system earlier this week by having a whole bunch of guys test positive, but knowing they could get them back if necessary, might do the same to John uh, McMullen today. Uh, they may well, get- I yeah, I think the difference is I don't want me back <laughs> by any necessity. They don't want me back by any necessity. But, uh, yeah, you might have jinxed me there, Jody. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, that's, it I've is had right. – I think I'm about a, 187 of 187 Very nice. in COVID tests. So, if you ruin the Cal Ripken light streak on the uh, – what could be the last one, by the way, there are negotiations between the pro football writers and and the league about stopping testing for writers because the players don't have the So it makes no sense. But we'll see how it happens. We'll see how you you sound like uh, Tom Brady, who has been disrespected this week on this show. <laughs> so I've got no problem yeah. disrespecting you either. So, um yeah, we're going to break down uh, not only this game, but looking forward to the next game. And, guys, uh, no new news. Uh, the Eagles are not going to go on the record, not that I expect them to, as to how protective they're going to be on their players in Saturday's game. Uh, Sirianni said on Monday, and as it moved off it, everything's on the table. Uh, they had a walkthrough practice yesterday, John. Learn anything, tip their hand. No, a couple of guys out were with injuries, didn't even participate in yesterday's game. Uh, what have you been able to read of the Eagles' moves on the uh, last couple of days since Nick Sirianni said everything's on the table? Yeah, I, I mean, the only thing is Jordan Mailata, Jalen Hurts, obviously. A couple of players said they want to play. Uh, that's what, you know, players are going to play in, in, in certain circumstances. They're going to want to play. Obviously, it's not their decision. So um, it isn't preseason. We talked a little about yesterday. You don't have the 90-man roster, so some guys got to play. I mean, that's just the, the math of the situation. So it is going to be interesting to see how Nick Sirianni. So did we lose Johnny Mac? Uh, We may have, we'll, we'll try and reestablish control with him. One thing he said, Jeff, uh, that I was going to bring up a little bit later, Uh, a couple of Eagle players said, Oh, they want to play. They expect to play. Uh, Yesterday via the media, I heard Ike Reese and uh, Mike Quick uh, and Seth Joyner on NBC sports Philly this morning. Oh, let the players play. Players play. Players, that's what the players do. Players play. Yeah, that's nice. I don't care. It, it, what the players want to do is not what's going to happen. It's what the coaches and the organization want to do. And if they think they are best served by protecting their players, guess what? Grab a good seat, guys, because you're not going into the game. I agree with you. And The other thing, too, is, Jody, we, we have to mention this. Why would you want to risk injury – when you know you're going to probably have seven or eight days to rest for that playoff game to begin with. Right. There's, it just doesn't make sense. John, you were saying, if you're back with us, uh, the players say they want to play should come as a surprise to no one. What does that matter? No, it doesn't. And, and, and that's what I said. I mean, it is going to be Nick uh, mentioned earlier in the week. He's only been in this position as an assistant really once uh, and, it was back in Kansas City, and uh, he was a lower-level assistant. Todd Haley was the head coach, and, and Todd decided to play his players. Didn't work. I think they lost the game. I think they lost the first round of the playoffs as well. Um, so he understands both sides, rest versus rust, uh, that type of thing. And 
Uh, what I was mentioning about the preseason versus a preseason like environment is you have those extra players. You don't necessarily have all those extra players. And that's where the COVID list gamesmanship comes in. Uh, the Eagles started early with Cameron Malvo and Jacoby Stevens. They already elevated them through those COVID protocols. So, uh, they're already doing a little bit of shuffling from that perspective. And then obviously the guys who are banged up, you don't expect to see it all. So Sean Bradley got in the little fender bender last week. Um, you know, they already ruled out Miles Sanders. Uh, they were honest about that. And, and you know, anybody, Landon Dickerson showed up on, on the injury report with a thumb, which is new. Um, anybody's banged up, you would think they would err on the side of caution. John, one of the players that I think would get a quote-unquote ceremonial start would be Jason Kelsey. But could you see him potentially play in all four quarters if, you know, if the Eagles wanted him to do that? Boy, no, I, I can't see him play in all four quarters. I, I do agree with you, Jeff, because of his lengthy consecutive game streak and starting streak. I think he's one of the guys that's likely to be back uh, on the active roster and he'll be out there for the coin toss and he'll start the game to keep that going. But, you know, Jason's banged up and a couple of weeks ago, you know, when he hurt his ankle and he said, Oh, it's a knee, it's an ankle. It's, <laughs> it's, it's everything. And he's got this giant brace. Uh, he looks like, uh, um, you know, whatever it, it, between him and my lot of my lot of can't raise his arm to snap to buckle his helmet. So maybe that will be uh, land. That's usually land to Dickerson's role. So now you got him with the thumb injury. He's going <laughs> to buckle Jordan's helmet if he plays. They got to play somebody, though. You only have again, it's not 90 players. It's only 47 on game day. So. Some guys got to play at least a little bit. And then you hope, you know, if it's going to be Brett Toth or somebody like that, or it's going to be Milton Williams uh, on the defensive side of the ball or Hassan Ridgeway, you got to hope they can go for 70 snaps and they don't get banged up. I, I, that's that's kind of where I think it's going to go. All right. Pardon the pun here, but will the Eagles on the offensive line be Coyote ugly on Saturday? Yeah, I mean, he's he's a possible elevation at some point or, you know, they could do it the either the COVID route. They could do it the, the practice squad route. He was one of the uh, four players that were protected this week on the you're, – you're allowed to protect four players on the practice squad. And, yeah, even as late as week 18, um, there are other teams in this league that might come and try to pill for a player. So – the Eagles have used that uh, list uh, pretty frequently throughout the season. And they've been one of the teams since it started last year. You know, a lot of the teams don't even protect four players. Uh, you know, we got in that discussion yesterday, Jody, but I got in a lot of trouble for saying, hey, you know what? The Eagles make better decisions than most teams in this league on a pretty consistent basis. And it starts with the general manager that everybody dislikes. Um, and that's another example of it. Again, things you don't think of, but every little rock uh, you can uncover uh, to try to find an advantage, the Eagles usually find it quicker than most. Uh, and, you know, that's really, if you go back to the beginning of the Lori era, I think uh, there's, there's three teams uh, that have made the playoffs more than the Eagles, and they're pretty obvious. We all know one. I'm not going to disrespect Tom Brady in, the, in front yeah. of Jody McDonald. About time. That's that's obvious. The New England Patriots. The Green Bay Packers should be obvious for, you know, bridging Brett Favre and, and, and Aaron Rodgers. And then the Indian, Indianapolis Colts because, well, who did they have for a bent, very lengthy period of time? Peyton Manning. Uh, and, and that's why. They've been there more. Now, the Eagles have had some good quarterbacks. You can call Donovan McNabb a, a borderline Hall of Famer. Uh, probably not going to make it. 
certainly not in the category of those four quarterbacks. Um, which that tells me over that span, and that is a significant, that's 90, what is that, Jeff, 95? Yeah, nine, nine, Jeffrey? 26 years. Yeah. Um, over that span, you could make a strong argument that this franchise makes more correct decisions than any other franchise for the simple reason they don't have a Hall of Fame quarterback. They never have. They've had some good ones. But they don't have a Hall of Fame quarterback, and they are pretty consistently good. And that's where I talk about the fan base being a, a little bit spoiled. The younger generation, not I, people who remember uh, pre-Jeffrey Lurie, they understand it's not always like this. Yeah. One thing I always want to bring up to you, John, especially since we yesterday with Hallie Roseman, where would you rank him? amongst the GMs in the league. Is he top 10? Top five. Top five. Yeah, I'm di- I'm, I'm diving in. People hate me anyway. Yeah, top five. It's not even close. They, they don't, they don't, first of all, there's more to the job than picking players in the first round of the draft. It, it's a very big job. It's an all-encompassing job in, in the side of football operations. When it talks about, you know, contracts, people kind of know that. But even stuff they don't know, hiring practices, you look at Joe Douglas, you look at Andrew Berry uh, getting spun off to be GMs. You know, Albert Breer does his, every year does his top 30 GM candidates. The Eagles have three on that list. So when Jeffrey Lurie taught, we joke about GM factory. Well, there it is. Brandon Brown, Ian Cunningham, Catherine Raish. Three of the 30 are in Philadelphia right now. They make a lot of good decisions. They make a lot of, and, and we joked about it with a little bit with the COVID stuff, but that's smart. That's smart. And, and then when you do get to the draft and people point out the obvious mistakes, the most obvious being uh, recently Jalen Rager. Uh, and even if you want to go back to J.J. Ortega Whiteside and on and on and on, they're not looking at the New England Patriots. They're not looking at the Green Bay Packers. They're not looking at, at the Indianapolis Colts because guess what? They've made first round mistakes as well. And they've made significant mistakes. And then there's no credit for fortifying those mistakes with the Jason Kelsey's of the world who's going to the Hall of Fame as a six round pick. You know, obviously the Patriots get credit for that because they got Tom at 199 in the sixth round. There's no credit for getting Jordan Mailata in the seventh round, who never played it down of football and developing him into one of the best tackles in the NFL. And on and on and on. Josh Sweat is turning into a, a, a tremendous player. I, I tweeted that out. I don't know if you guys saw me, but ESPN, ESPN's pass rush win rate. I know Jody loves this one. Uh, number one, Miles Garrett. Number two, Josh Sweat yeah. <laughs> in the entire National Football League. Fourth round pick. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's some good ones. And then this year, you do hit at the top of the draft, Devontae Smith and Landon Dickerson. I mean, Landon Dickerson is number two in the entire NFL at offensive guard for run block win rates. Number two, and as as a rookie, I, I I don't I I don't know what these people see honestly. You know what it is, John? I, I'll call them out. They don't want to admit they're wrong, and it's well, yeah, you know, it's just like with Jalen Hurts this year. Well, you know, he's not a franchise quarterback. Well, he's showing every signs he can be a franchise quarterback. And I think there are more Jalen Hurts defenders on here than most. But you definitely hear the vocal minority with Jalen Hurts. Well, he doesn't have the arm strength of Aaron Rodgers. Or he he's not Patrick Holmes. He's not Justin Herbert. Well, no, he's not. But he's also not Baker Mayfield either. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and by the way, everybody makes mistakes. That's not – you can point out mistakes. It's easy to point out mistakes. I can point out mistakes at every front office in the National Football League. So that's why I had Damo on yesterday. 
the most obvious one is uh, Jalen Rager versus Justin Jefferson. Nobody is saying that is not a colossal, colossal mistake. Uh, if that's the only decision you want to base it on, that is a really, really poor decision by the Eagles front office. And you know what? I can also say, and this is not mutually exclusive, I can also say the Will family, which owns the Vikings, would sure as heck trade Justin Jefferson for the Eagles front office. Because over a consistent period of making decisions, the Eagles front office is going to be their front office. And that's the case between the vast, vast majority of the front offices in the National Football League. Uh, by the way, John, I'll add on to this too. The Vikings sure know how to pick a wide receiver. They definitely don't know how to pick an offensive lineman. Well, it, yeah, exactly that. And, you know, and by the way, you know, if you want to use that team uh, as an example, they also drafted Laquan Treadwell in the first round, um, it, 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 who might be the only first round pick in recent years that you could argue ah, Jalen Rager might be a little bit better than Laquan Treadwell. That's how bad he was. And yeah, you mentioned, uh, yeah, they can't. Them and Seattle have been the two sort of semi-successful teams that make the playoffs every once in a while um, that can't find an offensive lineman to save their lives. It's pretty amazing. And, yeah, I mean, the Eagles on the offensive line are just ridiculous. I, I mean, you have other teams spending first and second round picks on the offensive line, and they can't develop them. And the Eagles are are trotting out Nate Herbig and Sue Opeta at times, and they're just fine. I, I mean, Jeff Stoutland deserves a lot of that credit. But who hired Jeff Stoutland? Who was able to keep Jeff Stoutland through three different coaching regimes? Uh, I, yeah. You know. Yeah, Howie Rose well, should get credit for that. And uh, you mentioned ratings, win rate, pass rate, but. Sorry if I've got an issue with ratings. Our friends at Pro Football Focus, again, came out with their ratings from this last week. Josh Sweat, the fourth best Eagle defensive player against Washington this week. Excuse me, Josh Smith. You, I think you said it to one of the coaches uh, in the media session. Was that a game-wrecking game by Josh Sweat? And I agreed wholeheartedly with your question but he was only the fourth best Eagle defensive player on the field as per pro football focus. So pardon me if I don't put complete stock into uh, the grades this week, although they did have Greg Ward as the number one Eagle offensive player, which you know I like. <laughs> ah, there, he had the biggest, ah, the biggest of the now, what, 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 I always, what I always explain, well, number one, it was ES, it, the, the pass rush run, that's ESPN. So that's not pro football focus. Yeah, I'm just talking about grades in general. Yeah. I, I, when you can throw grades, subjective grades at me. I understand what are given stats in the National Football League. Number of catches, yards, yards running, sacks. Uh, okay. Anything, anytime subjectivity comes into it and grading who got a win rate is a subjective grade. I'm sorry if I throw my, hold my nose. Yeah, but you know, you moment. know, my thought on that, what just basic statistics don't add is, is the context of, you know, okay, he who's throwing the, the pro football focus got Greg Waters number one? You well, in the context of he had two catches, come on. No, but, but he it, ran his routes right. That doesn't tell me anything. Well, well that's the thing, years. and it's a it's a small sample size because whatever Greg played, Greg didn't play a lot. So you have to add that into it, and that's what it is. It's about consistency from play to play. So. If you're and I said this last week when he asked me this question, if you're looking at, at PFF grades and 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 people do that and they just put, hey, these are the top 10 PFF grades and they do it for every team for the Los Angeles Chargers this week. These are the top five defensive grades for the Los Angeles Chargers. Well, that's not how you look at those things. That's not how coaches look at those things. Jonathan Gannon. Um, uh, agreed uh, with my question about Josh Sweat, and he train wrecked the game. And he was the defensive player of the game from the Eagles uh, coaching staff's uh, estimation. 
Because guess what? If you make a big play, so if you make a, a sack or, or you make a, a batted pass or you make a tackle for loss or whatever, um, it, you're going to get a really good grade on that play. And if you get uh, 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 sort of smoked on the next play and it doesn't even affect anything, well, individually, you're going to get a bad grade. The coaches understand that. It, so, you know, they, they put more of an impact on, on, on impact plays than pro football focus does. But nobody, when they put those things up on Twitter or people write about them, nobody adds the context or explains the grade. So, yeah, they, it doesn't, in that, in that instance, it, it doesn't really matter. John, one of, the, one of the things I wanted to kind of address with, with this football team going forward do you feel this team, uh, this Eagles team currently constructed, could pass their way to, say, a playoff victory against a bad secondary? Do you, do you think that's possible? Ah, boy. I, I, I don't know if it is. Uh, and I don't know if it is for a couple of reasons. One, I, I thought if there was any, way, any game they were going to pass, to win, it was going to be Washington. I mean, especially early. Whoever they had, and I, I forget who it was, whoever they had trying to cover Devontae Smith, was an, it was an embarrassment. I'm like, oh, man, they uh, they can really take advantage of this. And they didn't. I mean, they didn't for the most part uh, because they have, and correctly so. I'm not killing the coaching staff. I mean, it's understandable why they have become a, a run centric team because they've had so much success. But I, I, I said, you know, if this was the week and, and Dallas got, it was more, they couldn't cover him either. They had more success uh, getting the football to him just because I think Jalen is a little bit more comfortable um, throwing, throwing the ball inside than uh, not inside the numbers, but throwing the football uh uh, in a more inner intermediate area than than a deep area or outside the numbers deep down the field where Devontae Smith would be, you know, more explosive in a different offense. Um, I, I don't think they're there yet uh, in the passing game, but they're getting better. Uh, I mean, you know, it's getting better. And part of it also is, I, I, and, and Jody and I talked about this yesterday, Jeff, is the, the compliments aren't there at receiver as well. So, you know, if, if the Eagles do decide to go into a passing game, look, part of the reason Smith and Dallas are always open is that they're really good. Part part of the reason is nobody expects the Eagles to ever throw the ball. They're, they're now in this uh, part where, Okay, we got to stop the run. We got to stop the run. We got to stop the run. If all of a sudden they start chucking it all over the place, uh, well, then you're going to see the bracket coverages and you're going to see things change on those two particular players. And then they're going to say, Quez Watkins, go beat me. Jalen Rager, go beat me. Greg Ward, go beat me. And Jody might think Greg Ward's going to beat them, but I don't think Greg Ward's going to beat them. And by hook or by crook, he'll uh, help them get down the field. Um, uh, Jeff's question was dead on point because it very much looks like, much to the uh, chagrin of uh, John McMullen and Paul Domowich and uh, everybody else who's been on the show this week who have not shown enough respect for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Tom Brady, chances are they're going to be matching up against him because most of the scenarios that play out this weekend – lend themselves to the Eagles and the Bucks playing in the first game in the playoffs. Bucks are number three in the NFL in yards per game against the run. Vita Vega is, talk about a guy who wrecks a football game against the run. He is that caliber player. Let's say the Eagles uh, go three and punt in both of their first two possessions and are averaging a yard and a half per carry because Tampa can do that if they can shut down other teams' running game. Nick going to stick with it? Is he going to say, hey, they got to dance with the one that brought you and we've become a running team. We're going to run the ball until we can't run the ball anymore. Or will he uh, divert and go, all right, yeah, we can't run the ball against this team like Jalen Hurts, drop back and throw it 35 times. 
kind of depends on what um, Tampa does offensively. Do they score twice? Is it 10 nothing? Is it 14 nothing? Um, yeah, then they're going to abandon the running game. Um, if it's not, if it's 3 nothing, I, I think they would stick with it. If it's even 7 nothing, I think they would stick with it. Once you get down two scores, two possessions, um, Men, you got to be really, really disciplined. All I can go on from the first portion of the schedule, that's all we have with this coaching staff, um, they were not able to do that. And, you know, against a team like Tampa Bay uh, or any of the playoff teams, uh, because if you look at them and you look at their explosive offensive abilities, and I, I, I mean, that's that's not a good situation to be in because, well, A, by definition, the defense would be struggling. Uh, and to assume they're not going to continue to score is probably a bad assumption. So at that point, you almost have to abandon the running game if you're down two possessions. Because if you're going to come back and win the game, you're going to have to win most likely some kind of shootout in that type of situation john do you think there's any incentive for the eagles to potentially try to take that six seed just so you avoid say they win they pull an upset they would have to go play green bay but they're the six seed then it's kind of a hit or miss who they play in round two if they're thinking that far ahead yeah i don't i don't think they are what you know nick's been pretty consistent he's right uh, when he talks about that kind of stuff, you can't control what other people do. You can't control those situations. Um, if you're lucky enough to get to Green Bay, you're up against it anyway, no matter how, whenever you get there. Um, yeah, I, I don't think the Eagles will think like that at all. I think their only sentiment, it, 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 if they sit players this week, and I think we all expect them to, is to keep guys as healthy as possible for week one of the playoffs, no matter who they're playing. And then, you know, you let the chips fall where they may at that point. Um, you know, I, I do think it's a little bit more jockeying for position. Uh, you know, the best example of this would have been the double doink win in Chicago. Chicago had an opportunity to lose in, in, in at that point, week 17 um, against uh, Minnesota. And they just dominated Minnesota that season. Akeem, you know, we just talked about their offensive line. Keem Hicks was probably the most underrated uh, defensive tackle in football. He was right there behind Aaron Donald and Fletcher Cox at the time. And they just couldn't block him. And the Eagles had this great offensive line, as they always do. And the Eagles could block them, or at least do a decent job. And Matt Nagy said, no, we're going to play. We're going to win a meaningless game for them. And they got the Eagles, and they lost. And, you know, the history is where it is. And now Matt's going to lose his job. He's never recovered from that loss. So when it's an obvious situation, I think there's some merit. When there's so much murkiness, like there is now, I, I, you just, you know, you just do what you can do and control what you can control. All right. So, John, you got Wednesday assignments today in a different kind of week where the Eagles are going to play a Saturday game. Uh, so I know your week gets adjusted uh, because of the time frame. When do you think you'll have a good grasp, hopefully in time to share with our Birds 365 viewers and listeners, as to what the Eagles are going to do as far as minutes for guys, snaps, uh, level players, star players, guys coming up off the practice squad. And the same with the Cowboys, which is tougher to get that information, but it's your job uh, and you got to try and ferret it out. We're going to have to wait for the kickoff and see who jogs out onto the field. First possession for each team to figure out exactly how much they are looking to spare their players' potential injuries. Or do you think we'll have a better grasp of it before that? 
Well, I, I think with certain guys, it'll become a little bit more obvious. Again, s- some guys have to play. So I- if you're looking at, uh, you know, starters, for instance, um, uh, you know, younger starters, um, guys who aren't banged up, they're going to have to play a little bit um, uh, because of the numbers game. The most interesting part, from the Eagles perspective will obviously be Jalen Hurts who was still listed on um, the injury reports yesterday, which was a walkthrough. So it was an estimation, but he was still on there with the ankle. Uh, So it's going to be interesting. Do they, do they start him? Do they give him a quarter? Do they give him a half? How do they handle Jalen Hurts? And then the Cowboys, I mean, Jerry Jones is already on record saying they're going to try to win the game. Generally, Jerry tells the truth, whether people like him or not. And, you know, the Cowboys do what he says. So, um, you know, even Mike McCarthy didn't want to play certain guys. uh, If the big guy down there tells you they're playing, they're playing. So uh, you can argue the – what they should be doing because it's very unlikely they have a very small chance of being the the number two seed but it's very unlikely so mike has kind of spun it as you know nobody knows green bay better than mike mccarthy and it's going to be pretty cold on saturday night at least the last time i checked so he's trying to spin it as it'll be good um uh good practice if they eventually have to go to green bay uh to face the packers so I, I do think you're going to see more of an impetus from Dallas to win the game. Uh, and for the Eagles, it's more sort of targeted and how much do certain players play. Uh, I would be really, really shocked if at this point already, if Nick Sirianni just said, all right, we're going to play everybody and try to win this game. John, what does Dallas actually gain by this, though? By beating the Eagles, you know, say they, they beat them by 20 points again you know what do they gain by this I think we all know what they kind of are they're a very good football team that can't beat any team that seems to match their talent level or is near their talent level at this point uh nothing they don't gain anything uh people already uh know they're a good football team as you mentioned people think they're better than the Eagles already there's actually more to lose than to gain again than that small uh chance you have to to get the number two seed, which I don't think is realistic. Um, you know, maybe it was the emotion of coming off a perform- poor performance against Arizona. Um, and and Jerry said, we want to get them back out there, get them back feeling good about themselves. Um, yeah, but I, I agree with you. I think it's a mistake. And it, especially you would think losing Michael Gallup in that game for the season, you would think that would, you know, raise some antennas and say, oh, you know what, this isn't worth it. Let's let's get to um, the playoffs as healthy as possible. But <clears throat> the Cowboys players are just like the Eagles players. They want to play. That's more of a – that really is more of a front office media fan-driven thing uh, because if it were up to the players, they would play. And that's everybody. They would play. All right, Jay Mac. Last question. Um, since uh, you put Harry Roseman in the top five general managers of the National Football Ooh. League today, can um, I hear about that? By the way, yeah, uh, I need to ask you that type of a question because if you're going to get into the top five, you have to be able to both narrow focus and also look at the three thousand foot picture. Gardner Minshew plays well for the Eagles this week. He comes in off the bench. Jalen Hurts never sees the field. And despite the fact that he's playing with more of his second team buddies than the Cowboys are throwing out there, he finds a way to win the game. And he is 2-0 and filling in this year. The exact thing you're looking for out of your backup quarterback. You don't want to play it too much. That's a bad sign. But when he comes in, no drop off. Let's find a way to win games. And Gardner Minshew will have done that if he wins this week. Did the Eagles keep him or trade him? Um, I could see them spinning him off uh, for, you know, if you think uh, 
the Eagles got him for a six round pick. If if you can convince somebody that Gardner Minshew is a starting quarterback, that kind of all depends on the desperation of the other side. Uh, I think they would be very happy to keep him as a backup quarterback. We all know that uh, Gardner wants to be a starter. Uh, he went up to Nick Sirianni and said, what do I need to do to become the starter of this team? And got uh, shut down uh, by the head coach. So um, I, I could see it going either way. What they're not going to do is give him up for a fifth round pick, you know, and say, oh, I traded a six round pick. I'm giving up for a fifth round pick. Now, if somebody comes in with a second round pick and say, we don't have a quarterback and we think, yeah, they're going to trade him. third round pick. They're probably going to trade him. Uh, anything less than that, uh, very cost effective backup. And we know how this team values that position probably more than most. Another reason why they're top five. Um, it, 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 you know, this, this is a good backup quarterback in if the they, NFL. If they trade him for a fourth round pick, then I'm sorry how he falls from number five to number nine in my rankings, because Ooh. then they just got to go out and get another backup. Yeah. If you've got a good one. Why would you would... give him up to be able to brag and go, Hey, gave up a sixth, got a fourth. Great general manager. Now, yeah, but then now you got to go out and get another backup. So, no, that's what I said. If it's a, if it's a six or a five or six or a four, and you say that, I don't agree with that. If you get a third, I I'll I'll trade him. If you get a second, yeah, he's out the door. Yeah, um, I would I would agree with the second, third, maybe fourth, no. Uh, and uh, I I I think that Gardner will not be happy about it. But tough. Stick around and be the best backup quarterback in the NFL. Well, that is part of it, though, as well. If he's not going to be, if he's going to create issues, and I don't think he would, but you know, you that that is part of sort of the behind the scenes stuff as well. If he's that unhappy, uh, that might change the narrative as well. But I don't think that's the case. I just think he's a competitive uh, guy, um, and yeah, they'll just keep him because, as I said, he's very, very cost effective. And you've seen the backup quarterbacks in this league, and we've, uh, we've seen him against the Eagles on almost a weekly basis. Yeah, during the second yeah. half of the season. You mean you guys don't want Mike Glennon to be the Eagles' backup quarterback in 2022? Or or Sean Mannion. You got to see him live and in person on national television. Yeah, Gardner's a pretty good backup quarterback. So, um, yeah, uh, that's another good example of why. And it's not just if it makes people feel better. Uh, I want to I make pe people feel better. It's not just Howie Roseman. It's the Eagles front office as a whole. He just happens to lead it. They make a lot of good decisions. Howie Roseman at all. We get what you're saying. And the only thing that Mike Glennon's got going for him and he's, is that he's a Jeff Kerr lookalike. But other than that, <laughs> he does not belong in the National Football League. I, I might be able to have a higher winning percentage in the NFL. <laughs> I, I would not be surprised if that were the case. Uh, J-Mac, uh, if I jinx you, I'll apologize tomorrow here on Birds 365. But uh, hopefully no issues whatsoever. We'll talk to you again tomorrow, buddy. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. John McMullen, usual co-host of the Birds 365 show here on the Jacob Media YouTube channel. We got Jeff Kerr sitting in for him today. You Jeff Kerr fans out there, here's what you got to do. Hit that like button. Like, share, subscribe to us here on the, the Jacob Media YouTube channel uh, as we get you ready for playoff football with the Philadelphia Eagles. Didn't necessarily believe this was going to be the case when we started this show uh, eight or nine months ago. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in. Do us the favor, like, share, and subscribe here on the Jacob Media YouTube channel. This is Joe Krause of Krause's Coats inviting you to donate a slightly worn coat or jacket and help veterans stay warm this winter. Go to Krause's Coats on Facebook to help those who've served. Have a happy holiday.
At Stateside Vodka, every new customer gets the world's best rocks glass. Free. What's that? Uh, a rocks glass? You're telling me that bottle is cut in half? You could say that. Holy shit. And you're telling me I can get one of these glasses for free? That's right. One free rocks glass per customer with each first time purchase of Stateside Vodka. So good, it just disappears. The city of Philadelphia sparkles during the Christmas holiday season with an array of colorful light displays and illuminated Christmas trees donated or installed for free by the talented electricians of IBEW Local 98. To learn more about who we are, what we do, and career opportunities at IBEW Local 98, visit us at www.ibew98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Seven, zero, three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. As a hardworking American, you've never experienced how tough life can be until now. A catastrophic injury while working on the job. A personal injury from someone else's negligence. Turned away by other law firms in the region who didn't bother to learn your story. It's time to meet the Fritz and Beyond Cooley Law Firm and managing partner Brian Fritz. Badly injured? Call the Fritz and Beyond Cooley Law Firm. Find out why they say, we got this. Go for the midnight dares. Go for the game. Go for the hits. Go for the fans. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. Counting down the days to the Eagles and the Cowboys. Woohoo! Not what it usually is. Uh, kind of a weird situation this year, and that both teams have already qualified for the playoffs. How much are either team going to play? Uh, the Cowboys' stance as of now that they're going to go all out to get back into playoff form does befuddle me a little bit. I think it's an overreaction to their loss to the Cardinals this past week. Uh, the Eagles have said everything's on the table. Don't know how much guys are going to play. The fact that they've got as many guys on the COVID protocol list as they do, some key individuals, by the way, like Fletcher Cox, Yeah, I don't think those guys are coming off. I think they will pull in Eeyore. So it's not going to be the Eagles' best at the Cowboy best, which le- leads me to my next question. And, Jeff, I'm going to ask this of you the same way I've asked this of everyone else who's been on Birds 365 this week guests and my co-host John McClain, who I've asked plenty on my two WIP shows the last couple of nights, and to say I've been disappointed in the uh, responses would be a understatement. It kind of became a cause celeb yesterday when Paul Domwich forced me to walk off the show with his stance and answer to this question. Um, it only made sense that on Monday morning, Aaron Bird's 365, knowing that there was a chance that it could be Cooper Rush against Gardner Minshew for the Eagle Cowboy game. I said, let's move ahead to the playoffs. And we knew where the Eagles were at. We know where the Eagles are at. They could either finish sixth or seventh. No higher than that. Their their movement in the playoffs is not all that important. That's why I don't think if they win or lose this game, it makes much of a difference against the Cowboys. The Cowboys can move up on the upper half of the bracket, they've already won a division. They know they're going to be hosting the first game, but they need help from others, pretty big help from others, to be able to get out of the four slot where they are right now. Um, so we've got a pretty good grasp on who the Eagles are going to be playing. I'm sure you've seen it somewhere. I thought Kemsky did a great job of breaking it down on Philly Voice. There are 32 scenarios, potential scenarios, as to who the Eagles are going to play in the playoffs. Them winning, Cowboys winning, four other games. Uh, There are 32 different potential scenarios. 
22 of which lead them to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the first round. So that's over a 60% chance they're going to play Tampa. And the other three break that. I think the Cowboys are all of 6%. They got a 6% chance to play the Cowboys and a 65% chance to play the Buccaneers. But if that were not the case and not in place, if I asked you to rank the four potential playoff teams that the Eagles could be playing uh, next week, Jeff, Rams, Cardinals, Cowboys, Buccaneers, put them in the order that the Eagles are most likely to be able to win the game. On the road, going to be an upset. They're going to be an underdog. We acknowledge that. But of those four teams, what would be your preference rating of who you would like to see the Eagles play? Because they have the best chance to uh, pull the upset. So I, I'll i say this. I do not want them any parts of Tom Brady. I just don't want any parts of this guy. The Buccaneers should have lost to the Jets Sunday. And the Buccaneers have been playing terrible. And they got a bunch of drama. And they're beat up. They can't run the football. Their offensive line is not It's still really good. But it hasn't been as good. Their defense, it's... You can kind of run against them. I know that they're in the league against the run, but if you actually challenge them, you can run against them. I still don't want any parts of Tom Brady. I just don't. The guy does not lose. He doesn't lose football games. So they're not number one to me. You know who's number one? The Rams. I would like to see that Nick Sirianni and Sean McVay go head-to-head in the battle of wits because Matthew Stafford's not playing that well. And I know Odell Odell Beckham's been bailing that team out of a lot of situations. I know Cam Akers is coming back. Andrew Whitworth's coming back. Their offensive line, it, it's good. It's not great. I think the Eagles can get home. But to me, the Rams have a ton of talent, but they're not living up to it right now. And they're probably going to win the division. They're going to be playoff tested, uh, you know, just based on playing in the NFC West, playing the Cardinals, playing the 49ers. They've had a tough schedule. I think I'd rather see them play the Rams first, then probably the Cardinals, even though I, I don't like the Cardinals matchup against them either. Um, Tampa third, and I'll go Dallas last because oh, I. Oh, there you are again. I'm, I'm, why are Why are you afraid of the Dallas Cowboys? I'm there not are afraid. so many people that have been on this show, the fans that I've talked to, my WIP compatriots that somehow have developed a fear of the Dallas Cowboys. You know what this is? is Philadelphia we're talking you about, is, and a Philadelphian, and well, and I know you're a media guy, but it, in your heart of hearts, you're an Eagle fan. How the hell are you afraid of the Dallas Cowboys? This is what it comes down to for me with the Cowboys. They are great at beating teams that are that they are clearly better than, and they're clearly better than the Eagles. Now, I will say this: I think the I think Eagles would give them a hell of a football game, and I mean a hell of a football game if they can run the football. My issue is Dallas is the ultimate front-running team in the NFL today. When they get a lead, they pound the. They just pound the gas pedal. When they beat Washington 59-14, to 14, it was 59-7 at one point, I'm like, that's great. Washington stinks. You're just doing what you always do. You beat bad football teams to a pulp. But when you have to play a team that has a pulse, like the Arizona Cardinals, and don't give me the New England Patriots. I don't think well, they're the, that Do the Eagles have a pulse? I think they have a semi-pulse. I think they can give them a game. I just don't think, pound for pound, the Eagles can't match up with them. That, that's just my opinion. In, but, in Dallas, but they can match up better with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Tom Brady. I don't want Tom Brady. I don't want anything. No, no, no. You Brady. just said in order: Rams, Cardinals, Buccaneers, Cowboys. Which means it's the Cowboys that you're most fearful of. Which yeah, means no, you're, you're more fearful me. of the Cowboys than the Buccaneers. They're, Please explain this to me. You're asking me how I want to die right now. Do I want to jump? Yes, I am. I, I think the off. reference of death is important in one's life. Hey, you know what? If I'm going down, I'm going down swinging. To, I don't want to go down swinging to Tom Brady. The guy just doesn't lose. And by the that's way, that's why. It, that's you're right. That's why I'm asking you. Why isn't he the team that you would want to play least? I, I'm just gonna say this. I watched Man in the Arena last night, episode Who, what, eight. Was, what? 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 What did you say? You watch what? Man in the Arena, the Tom Brady docu series. It's like oh, okay. All right. Yeah, I didn't so, know the name of that. All so right. he's on episode eight. And episode eight is where he loses the Foles. He's so bitter over losing to the Eagles. I swear, he that is going to be the guy that's going to go. I went there for 500 yards and five touchdowns against this team in a playoff game to prove a point. I'm like, I don't want anything to do with him. I, I, I'll take Sean McVay and his overratedness, and I will take, you know, who is he? Arizona. 
Nick Sirianni can beat Cliff Kingsbury in a battle of wits. I love the Cardinals, but I'll take the two NFC West teams over. To, and look, Dallas just sees them enough. And I know this isn't week three, but I don't – maybe it's just my distrust in Jonathan Gannon. I know the numbers say otherwise, but – it just seems like guys like Dak Prescott, the mobile quarterbacks, the Dak Prescott, the Kyler Murrays of the world, and guys with actual weapons, and I mean, like, Dallas does have weapons. I just feel like that's a team that they're going to get a lead on the Eagles early and they're just going to pound it. If the Eagles can keep it close or halftime in third quarter, I'll really like their chances. But that that's a team where I just don't want to get my expectations all hyped up for a team that's clearly better than Philadelphia. I, I I don't have a problem of your giving Dallas credit for what they've accomplished. They won this division. Um, even if the Eagles win, they're still going to finish the game behind them. But I think it's kind of telling because people are getting on the Eagles case because, you know, they haven't beaten a team over 500 all year. Cowboys yeah, no. don't really beat anybody either. They, they beat the Patriots. In exactly. The only difference between the Cowboys and the Eagles, the teams that they played, which – 14 out of the 16 games are the same exact teams, some road, some home, but it's basically the same schedule except for th three out of the 17 games. They've done the same thing the Eagles have, except the Eagles beat the Broncos and lost to the Chargers. The Cowboys beat the Chargers but lost to the Broncos, and the Eagles lost to the Giants once, and the Cowboys were good enough to not lose to the Giants. That is that is the game that Eagle fans are going to look back and rue this year. How the hell did we lose to the Giants? They stink. Every yes, you lost to the Giants. But that's it. Other than that, the Cowboys season is the same as Eagles season. Why wouldn't you want to get another shot at them? And you know what's funny, Jody? It, it's You asked me this three weeks ago. I was like, you know what? Bring them on. Bring them on the Dallas Cowboys. I, I, I'll take it. But it's one of those where I saw – I just watched that entire snap of that game against Washington twice. And I'm like – and I know Gallup's not back. He won't be back. But I'm thinking, man, when they're on, they're on. And But then the back of my mind saying, well, hold on a second. They beat Washington. They beat Washington. You know, they didn't. I said, do this against the Cardinals. And then I'll shut up. Well, they didn't do it against the Cardinals. And I was very vocal on Twitter about that. Well, who have you beat? And then, you know, I get, well, who are the Eagles being? I'm like, I don't care who the Eagles are being. The Eagles aren't Super Bowl contenders. The Dallas Cowboys are supposedly Super Bowl contenders. So, that's who I'm stacking them up against, the Green Bay Packers, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I think the Eagles can look up to the Dallas Cowboys. And I'll say this. If they play the Dallas Cowboys in the wild card game and beat them, Nick Sirianni, I know Coach of the Year voting will be set by then. Nick Sirianni should be Coach of the Year because that, that that's a team that just got beaten to a pulp by Dallas in Week 3. It wasn't even close. The And the Cowboys, oh, by the way, Got beat by the Cardinals last week or in the playoffs, and um, the Cardinals are a quality level playoff team. They're a football team. It's but in your house, and the Cardinals have lost three straight games. That's not a good effort out of the Dallas Cowboys. You said it, everybody else who's told me that they would rank the Cowboys as a tougher opponent than Tampa said that oh, they just about beat the Jets last week. E correct. The difference is they won on the road. And the Cowboys lost at home. They came up short at home, lost the game that they really needed, that they wanted because they were still in the potential picture for the number one overall seed at the time. See you later, bye, because they couldn't beat the Cowboys. And yes, they they had the 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 Buccaneers had a rally to beat the Jets, and I've been saying, oh yeah, the Jets defense stinks. Well, then what did Tom Brady do? He goes right down the field in under two minutes, sticks it into the end zone, and remember this name. Because you're going to learn about it over the next several weeks. Cyril Grayson, former LSU sprinter, I did not play it. football at LSU. Non-football player gets the game-winning touchdown pass. He is going to become a Tom Brady favorite. Mark my words, this week, into the playoffs and the like, no Antonio Brown, um, no uh, God uh, Goodwin. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cyril, yeah. Cyril Grayson, a guy who was not – I believe he's been on, let's see, Seattle, Indianapolis, Texans, Bears, uh, Saints, Cowboys. He's with the Cowboys for a week on their practice squad. Finally landed in Tampa Bay. Somehow Tom Brady makes guys like Cyril Grayson into players. He will do it again this postseason. You want no part. And I'm sorry to say, Eagle fans, chances are you're getting Brady. 
Chances are that's where you're going. Chances are this is yeah, guy... Tampa. So, I mean, it'll be a fun place to watch a playoff game. I don't know if I want to watch Tom Brady cut him, you know, them die a thousand cuts because that's what he's going to do. It's going to be like the week six game. You think you're in, you think you're in it, and then Tom Brady just takes her soul out. He, he just rips it out. I, I, you know what? The Eagles playing the Buccaneers was like Dallas playing the Cardinals. The Buccaneers dominated them for the majority of that game. Then they kind of took their foot off the gas, just like the Cardinals did. And the Cowboys came back, but the Bucs made sure the Eagles never got the ball back, and the Cardinals did the same thing with the Cowboys. All right. Uh, one other thing I want to get in here, Jeff, before we take a timeout. Um, Jeff Mosher from InsideTheEagles.com is going to be on with us uh, coming up at 25 minutes from now. I haven't had Mosher on in a good couple of months, so I'm looking forward to talking to him. Um I, I, I brought this up on my WIP show last night. I don't do this often, put poll questions on Twitter. Maybe once every two months, I might do six poll questions a year, somewhere thereabouts. But I thought about this yesterday when I was walking my dog. And oh, by the way, that's where I do my best thinking is when I'm out giving a dog a walk uh, about uh, the Eagles and their quarterback situation past 2021. Um, Because that's all we've been talking about since Carson Wentz got traded, right? Is Jalen Hurts going to be good enough this year? Is he going to be good enough to be their future quarterback? Uh, So I said, you know, let's trot this out here today. Because it seems to me that the Eagle fans, in a large picture way, are are starting to buy more into Jalen Hurts. There's been just as many questions as answers. um, But it seems of late with both his on-field activities and off-field activities, uh, he's become a more popular guy. So uh, I put this question to Eagle fans. Who would you want the Eagles to have as their quarterback for 2022 with cost included? So I gave them my best guesstimation of guys who could be potentially acquired, but the cost it would uh, probably uh, come up as to uh, acquire their services. So I said, Russell Wilson, if he does get dealt from Seattle, which, oh, by the way, I, I'm on the record. I don't think he's going anywhere. I think he's staying put in Seattle. I know that puts me in the minority. Most people think Russell will be elsewhere. I don't. I think he's staying. Um, and if you trade for him, I think it's going to cost you three ones. Deshaun Watson, now assuming his legal situation has moved on, I'm not going to project or predict uh, if he's going to be found guilty or innocent or they work out deals or, shoot, there's still a possibility the criminal charges could be brought. So I'm just assuming... He's in a better position. He's tradable. You may have to take on some responsibility with that and wait for him and have some patience. But let's say he's tradable. And let's say uh, the Texans can get him, uh, get what they're asking for him, which was reportedly three first-round picks. So Deshaun Watson for three first-round picks. Another guy who, so I think it was BLG, threw his name into the mix with me one night on WIP, our buddy Brandon Lee Gowton from Bleeding Green Nation. He said he thought Derek Carr could be on the open market this offseason. If the Raiders lose this week, new head coach, new building, take it down to the studs, build it back up, part of that being moving off Derek Carr. I said, I thought the price tag for Carr, who's pretty damn good, well, Eagles watched him tear him, tear them apart. Him, he's good. He's good. <laughs> watched him tear them apart this year. I think the price would be about a one and a second pick. Uh, maybe a two, maybe a three. You offer a four. They ask for a two. You settle at the three. So I said one of the three. Or you get Jalen Hurts for free because he's already here. You don't have to give up anything to get him, but he is the least accomplished of those four quarterbacks there, certainly, that I put out. And I said, who would you want as the Eagle quarterback uh, for uh, 2022? What do you think the percentage breakouts were between – Wilson for three ones, Deshaun for three ones, Carr for a one and three, Jalen Hurts for free. What do you think the percentage breakout uh, was? I'm sure the percentage was high for Wilson. That, that'd be my guess. Uh, okay. Of those who uh, chimed in and I got 632 votes and I got two hours left. I put it up for like 16 hours. I put it up yesterday afternoon. Um, Russell Wilson has Whoa. three per- all right. 3% of the vote. Hey, I'm 3%. Like he would be the lowest. Deshaun Watson has 5.4% of the vote. Derek Carr has the equal amount, 5.4% of the vote. 
Jalen Hurts, 85.4%. Eagles fans, I'm loving it right now. I'm absolutely loving it because that's what you should do. Keep the guy you already have and develop him and get draft picks around him. You don't need to trade three first-round draft picks for Russell Wilson, who, by the way, has been okay this year. He hasn't been great. I love Russell Wilson, too, don't get me wrong, but I agree with you, Jody. I don't think he's leaving Seattle. As a matter of fact, I actually had the – CBS gave me the, the task of – finding four potential destinations if Antonio Brown would ever come back to the NFL. And one of them is wherever Russell Wilson goes because Russell Wilson loves him. Do you really want that headache here? Because that's what you would get when you get Russell Wilson. I love Russell Wilson, but some of his like personnel decisions, it's very questionable. It's going to make you like, okay, what are we doing here? And obviously I don't want any parts of the Sean Watson, legal troubles and all. I, I just don't. Derek Carr I like, but Jalen Hurts can develop into a Derek Carr. I, I, I like Jalen Hurts. I think Jalen Hurts is a leader for this team. I think he's really good for them. He's a guy that can keep growing, keep developing. And by the way, uh, you know, we talked about this for the show. He's got a year similar to what Donovan McNabb did in 2000. And we all knew McNabb was a franchise quarterback. We all knew that because he was number two overall pick. The only reason we're not saying this about Jalen Hurts is because he wasn't the number two overall pick. Uh, and both you and I are quite happy that Jalen Hurts not only won this little poll, the one's still got a couple hours left. If you want to go on my Twitter and swing the numbers a little bit at Jody Mac, I love the 90. <laughs> J O D Y M A C M A N. Feel free, Birds 365 fans, to uh, vote on the poll. Um, yeah, I just didn't think it was going to be this lopsided. Glad to see it. I agree with it. That would be my number one choice. And Jalen Hurts is running away with it. All right, we're going to take a quick timeout when we come back. Jeff's kind of gave you a tease there. Good job out of you uh, about an article he's got coming up on CBSSports.com, comparing the current Eagles quarterback to the former Eagle quarterback Donovan McNabb. Jeff will give us more details on that next here on Birds Three Sixty Five. This is Joe Krause of Krause's Coats inviting you to donate a slightly worn coat or jacket and help veterans stay warm this winter. Go to Krause's Coats on Facebook to help those who've served. Have a happy holiday. At Stateside Vodka, every new customer gets the world's best rocks glass, free. What's that? Uh, a rocks glass? You're telling me that bottle is cut in half? You could say that. Holy shit. And you're telling me I can get one of these glasses for free? That's right. One free rocks glass per customer with each first-time purchase of Stateside Vodka. So good, it just disappears. The city of Philadelphia sparkles during the Christmas holiday season with an array of colorful light displays and illuminated Christmas trees donated or installed for free by the talented electricians of IBEW Local 98. To learn more about who we are, what we do, and career opportunities at IBEW Local 98, visit us at www.ibew98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. As a hardworking American, you've never experienced how tough life can be until now. A catastrophic injury while working on the job. A personal injury from someone else's negligence. Turned away by other law firms in the region who didn't bother to learn your story. It's time to meet the Fritz and Beyond Cooley Law Firm and managing partner Brian Fritz. Badly injured? Call the Fritz and Beyond Cooley Law Firm. Find out why they say, we got this. 
Go for the midnight tears. Go for the game. Go for the hits. Go for the fans. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resorts. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. Birds 365 here on the Jacob Media YouTube channel. You got Jeff Kerr in for uh, John McMullen. Johnny Mack was on with us earlier. Um, he is headed off to the Wells, uh, the Wells Fargo, uh, to the Novacare Complex to make sure he's not COVID positive. But with the breakout there, I'm I'm thinking it's about 50-50, even though he told us he thinks he's 162-0 and 0 in tests this year. Did, did you guess. see what one of our commenters said? I, I was cracking up during the break. John McBall yeah. is the Justin Tucker of COVID tests. There you go. Uh, oh, I love it. Money in the bank when it comes to five. But even – didn't Tucker miss one this year? Uh, I think he did. He didn't miss any in the games I covered this year, but I, I think he, Justin Tucker does miss them every once in a while. But I, I do. I think he's missed one very, very, very infrequently. You are correct. Um, but that's funny in doing my research to defend my position of show me the Cowboys, give me the Cowboys every day of the week rather than Tom Brady and the Buccaneers. Um, yeah, the Bucks kind of have a major edge in playoff experience. Seeing as the majority of the guys on the team were just there and went 4 0 last year on their way to a Super Bowl. Meanwhile, the Cowboys players with winning playoff experience, almost not a. The only one who's got decent experience is their kicker, Greg the Leg, who went to the Super Bowl with the Rams a couple of years ago, who, oh, by the way, this year stinks. He's missed six field goals and five extra points. He missed an easy one on Sunday. It's, you know what, Jerry? I, I, I don't want to rip on the Cowboys too much, but I'm going to right now. Feel free. And it, and it has. Why, to, why? Why would you hold and, back? And it has. It has to do with their franchise quarterback. Dak Prescott is starting to become a guy that he's very good, but he does not win big games, and it's in. It's an indictment of his football team. All I hear is, well, he came back against Aaron Rodgers and the Packers. Still lost. Um, you know, Nick Foles is more playoff wins than Dak Prescott. Yep. You know, Dallas fans love to rip on the Eagles nonstop. But their quarter, they're starting to get in that purgatory where it's, is this guy really good enough to get us the Super Bowl? Oh, by the way, he has all the weapons around him. We paid him $40 million a year. We pay this running back $15 million a year, and he hasn't had over 60 yards in the game since week five. His backup's better than him. You really have – oh, and by the way, the offensive line's aging. You really have to wonder what the future of this franchise is right now. They have to win now. And they're not – look, they're they're the fifth best team in their conference. That's the reality of it. There's a very good chance, uh, and we kicked this around – uh, leading up to last week's activity when the Eagles actually qualified for the playoffs, got the win they needed, and got a little help from some friends outside, that the Eagles could play the Cowboys back-to-back weeks. They could play them in week number 18 and then have to play them again the week thereafter. And that's still a possibility, just a small possibility. Out of the 32 different scenarios, two of them have the Eagles and the Cowboys playing again next week, which is less than a 7% chance. And the fact that the chance they're going to play the Bucks is over in excess of 60%. So chances are that's the way it's going to go. But we could see a rematch, short-term turnaround, in the Cowboys having to play the Cardinals again. That they played just last week. They get a week, Eagles-Cowboy week in between, which we don't know how much the teams are going to play their best players. And then the Cardinals might get a chance to go right back in there to Dallas again. And everyone keeps quoting the stats of uh, Murray's record in that building. He's undefeated. He team played there a bunch when he was in high school. Uh, so he, he knows how to win in that building. The Cowboys could be done by the first round of the play. The Eagles game might be more competitive around number one than the Cowboys game. Colin Murray is just a mismatch for that. Uh, you know, Michael Parsons is probably the only person who can match Colin Murray's speed. But you take – if he doesn't dominate, they have a problem. And look, 
everybody loves to talk about Trayvon Diggs and his 11 interceptions. I think he's given up like 17 yards per catch this year. The only reason the opposing quarterback's passer rating is so low when they target Trayvon Diggs is because he has 11 interceptions. Like, But he gives up a lot of big plays. Like, A.J. Green had a lot of big plays off him Sunday. And Christian Kirk is another one. He he was a match. He was a mismatch against him. And the Cardinals can throw the ball. Oh, by the way, they're going to get James Conner back for that game. There, there's a pretty good chance that's going to happen. I think that's going to be a huge plus for them. Uh, DeAndre Hopkins, I don't know if he'll be back for the playoffs. That's going to be interesting. But, yeah, it's – the Cardinals and the Cowboys, just by watching the film, and if you just look at the, the sheets, they should beat them. The Cardinals are a better team than them. And, yeah, Dallas could be one and done if they play them again. It's very likely it's going to happen. Kyler Murray is a mismatch for a lot of a lot of defenses in this league just because of his ability to run, kind of like Jalen Hurts in a way. But he's got enough weapons where he doesn't have to necessarily play well for the Cardinals to win. Because the Cardinals have an underrated defense in and of itself. All right, Jeff, you teased before we went to break an article you're working on for CBSSports.com about the Eagles quarterbacks, both past and present. Uh, Of course, the Eagle quarterback, who may very well have had the best run in the history of the Eagles at that position, Uh, Donovan McNabb was uh, the number one draft pick of the Eagles uh, 20 plus years ago. Um, And Jalen Hurts was a second round draft pick. So their expectations coming in were certainly different, but you did some research that says the production in their second year as member of the Eagles is actually pretty similar. Yeah, it is. And look, football was completely different 21 years ago, Jody, you know that I know that, but you know, Don McNabb coming into that year, there were questions about him, too, about his ability to throw the football. And he didn't really have the greatest of weapons around him, if you remember. It's Aaron Small, Charles Johnson. But, like, Jalen Hurts and Devonta Smith, Don McNabb relied on Tarrant Small and Chad Lewis, who ended up becoming a pro. Remember, Chad Lewis wasn't really anything before that 2000 season. And he ended up becoming a pro bowler. Jalen Hurts relies on Dallas Goddard. The 2000 Eagles, which is really eerie, by the way, they finished the year 6-2. and two. This current iteration of the Eagles are 6-2. and two. They changed their identity, of course, but so did the Eagles. They had to change it because Deuce Staley got hurt. Remember at the beginning of the year, they were, let's give the ball to Deuce Staley. Deuce Staley's going to be our offense. And Deuce Staley has a Liz Frank injury. Well, then all of a sudden, Don McNabb had to carry that football team with his arm, with his legs, and he got slowly better as the year went on uh, with his arm. And I think a lot of that had to do with because you had to – account for the running factor. It's not like Andy Reid had a lot of design run plays for him. McNabb just kind of, if he didn't see anybody open, this is back when McNabb would actually take off, and he wasn't overweight, and he wasn't had he didn't have his issues because he never wanted to be a running quarterback, but that was part of his best football. And McNabb in December that year threw five touchdown passes, one interception, had a 95 passer rating, was a top five quarterback throwing the football. Yeah, 95 passer rating used to be good here, folks. It wasn't Dick and yeah. Dalton. You know, you get a high passer rating. But now would actually throw the ball downfield. He was like second in the league in yards per 10th. And he was running the ball, too. Remember, I had the big game against Washington. And, you know, it's kind of like, in a way, Hurts against the Saints. You know, Hurts had that three rushing touchdown game. Like, that was like the Nav against Washington. Was most rushing yards for a quarterback since Bobby Douglas at the time. And, you know, that, that really got the MVP chatter going for Donovan. But, you know, McNabb was one of the best quarterbacks in football toward the end of the season. for the second MVP voting. And then what Jalen Hurts was really good in December, too. You know, he had a Harvard one passer rating. He's ranked in the top five amongst quarterbacks in, in passer rating in December or the last. I, I did like a three game, three, four game stretch, obviously, because he missed the game, with, you know, against the Jets. But if you look at his last three games, he's, you know, top two. Top 10 completion percentage. He's top five, top five in passer rating. Um, you know, still up there in rushing yards, even though he hasn't run the ball that much. But McNabb was one of, was only the third quarterback at the time. Randall Cunningham and Steve McMahon were the other two that 2,000 passing yards and over 600 rushing yards in a season. And 600 rushing yards for a quarterback was a big deal at the time because it, only Cunningham and uh, I think Bobby Douglas did it. And, you know, this is pre-Michael Vick. Well, Hertz is one of only eight quarterbacks to throw for 3,000 yards and rush for 750 yards in a season. So it, they're both very similar years. They both have lack of weapons on the offense. The Eagles defense was much better in 2000. Uh, you know, obviously you have Brian Dawkins and Hugh Douglas. Hugh Douglas was a pro bowler. Dawkins was a pro bowler. Corey Simon was a stud. Trotter was a pro bowler. Uh, Bobby Taylor wasn't, but he was still 
uh, criminally underrated. Troy Vincent was a pro bowler. David Moore was really good. And that, that team was loaded on the defensive side of the ball. The numbers didn't show it all the time, but they they had the talent. And you saw that in the wild card round against Tampa Bay when they beat them. You know, a lot of people thought Tampa Bay was a better team than the Eagles going into that, even though Tampa Bay had the hex of they couldn't win in 40-degree weather. It felt like an Eagles, like, this was going to be the Eagles' stepping stone. And it was. And it led to the greatest era in Eagles history. And Hurts is kind of on the same path as McNabb a little bit. Didn't play that much his rookie year. You know, when he did play, it was toward the end of the year. It was lost. Well, that was Andy Reid's first year. But this is Nick Sirianni's first year. Plays Jalen Hurts a whole year. Puts up similar numbers with lack of weapons. Get Jalen Hurts some more weapons around him. Might be the same path as McNabb. I mean, they're both very similar, you know, in year two for both of them. Their years were similar, their numbers were similar, and you're comparing the teams, which in certain ways were pretty damn similar. One other one was pretty good offensive line. Yeah. Eagles offensive line this year, Eagles offensive line in front of Donovan McNabb, which is growing together, much like this one, with uh, Jordan Mailata being a big piece and a guy who's just coming into his own here in his first year as a starting left tackle. That's kind of key. The quarterbacks know that. Uh, we probably don't talk about it enough, how much the offensive line is the ballywick of uh, offenses overall. If you don't have the chance to dominate in the trenches, everything just gets that much more difficult. I think uh, Donovan McNabb certainly took advantage of it, and Jalen Hurts will be given the chance to take advantage of it as well. All right, Jeff Carr, Jody McDonald, here with you on Birds 365. We've got Jeff Mosher up to join us next. I and and Kerr kind of vacillated on this, but Domwood said it and McMullen said it and uh who else? Oh, Chris Franklin was on set that they rate the Dallas Cowboys as a tougher matchup in the playoffs than the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. It just boggles my mind that intelligent football media persons would actually buy into that. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. Mosh, I'm putting the pressure on you, buddy. You got to come up big for me here. You can't. You can't just add to the list of football dopes who think it would be easier to play Tom Brady and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers than it would be to play Dak Prescott and the Dallas Cowboys. It will be just one of the many questions we've got for Jeff Mosher, who's going to join us next from InsideTheEagles.com. He's our next guest up here on Birds 365. This is Joe Krause of Krause's Coats inviting you to donate a slightly worn coat or jacket and help veterans stay warm this winter. Go to Krause's Coats on Facebook to help those who've served. Have a happy holiday. At Stateside Vodka, every new customer gets the world's best rocks glass, free. What's that? Uh, a rocks glass? You're telling me that bottle is cut in half? You could say that. Holy shit. And you're telling me I can get one of these glasses for free? That's right. One free rocks glass per customer with each first-time purchase of Stateside Vodka. So good, it just disappears. The city of Philadelphia sparkles during the Christmas holiday season with an array of colorful light displays and illuminated Christmas trees donated or installed for free by the talented electricians of IBEW Local 98. To learn more about who we are, what we do, and career opportunities at IBEW Local 98, visit us at www.ibew98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. As a hard-working American, 
You've never experienced how tough life can be until now. A catastrophic injury while working on the job. A personal injury from someone else's negligence. Turned away by other law firms in the region who didn't bother to learn your story. It's time to meet the Fritz and Beyond Cooley Law Firm and managing partner Brian Fritz. Badly injured? Call the Fritz and Beyond Cooley Law Firm. Find out why they say, we got this. Go for the midnight dares. Go for the game. Go for the hits. Go for the fans. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resorts. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. It is a Birds 365 Wednesday edition. Jeff Kerr, Jody McDonald, and Jeff Mosher, who are going to have to ask to put the Cheerios down for a second. We'll uh, let him finish as soon as we're finished with him here, but he's going to give us 20 minutes of Eagles insight for uh, <laughs> the next uh, several minutes. Mr. Mosher, how are you? I'm great. Gentlemen, how are you guys doing? Can't complain, Jeff. Can't complain. <laughs> You're snacking you it up pretty good, good there with uh, your cereal. Um, <laughs> Eagle fans seem to be, pardon the pun, eating it, it up. This Eagles uh, playoff clinching uh, spot in week 17 before we even get to the end of the season. Jeff Laurie told us last year uh, that this was going to be a transitional year for the Philadelphia Eagles. Is it is it more to it than, hey, look, Nick Sirianni, although he may have been questioned after his first uh, first press conference has been phenomenal as his coach. He's going to get the yeoman's part of the credit for this. Who else should that in a year that was supposed to be transitional ends up as a playoff year. Somebody should be getting some pretty damn good credit for this. Who should that be? Well, um, I mean, we, we can go down the list. A lot of people for credit uh, from players to coaches, as you brought up management, uh, I don't know that this year is not still transitional, though. So I don't want to kind of move the goalposts and say that because they made the playoffs that the year is – the expectations may have been um, a little bit different. But I think depending on what happens here in Week 18 and what happens in the first round of, uh, of the playoffs, um, very much could determine how the offseason goes as well. So I, I still believe the evaluation part of the year – uh, is going on, and I believe that there could be uh, a lot of different type of changes to based on how the next game or two or beyond go. And so, um, it to me is still a transitional year, and that the team could look fairly different next year. And I think the the best part of this year is that not a lot of people saw it coming, especially at two and five, and they're doing it in a way that I don't think is going to last very long, um, or or that you're going to see a whole lot with this heavy running game. And we know in Philadelphia, people love that. So I almost feel like it's kind of a, a one-year gift to the Eagle fan who had to survive uh, an offseason last year that was not supposed to be what it wound up being. And so it's something that you enjoy in the moment, and then you see how things are uh, moving forward. Jeff, you know as well as I do, the NFL's a week-to-week league. Like, seven days ago, Tua Tagovailoa is the Dolphins franchise quarterback. Now they can't wait to run him out of town because he plays like crap against Tennessee. Are you hearing anything that maybe the ownership, you know, they love Jalen Hurts or are they committed to him for 2022 and beyond? Yeah, that's a good question, uh, Jeff. My, my sense is, and, and I'll go back to what I said before, that it's still a, an evaluation that, um, do, I, you know, from what I hear, they do love Jalen Hurts. They love him as a person. They love him as a leader. They think he's a developing quarterback. Uh, as well. But, you know, I, I also sense that they're not losing sight of what the year has been, what the schedule has looked like over the last seven weeks and what lies ahead. Obviously, a, a better Dallas Cowboys team. And we don't even know who's going to be starting in that game. But then clearly in, in week, yeah, I'm sorry, in the first round of the wild card game, that's another litmus test to really measure what this team really is. And, you know, I think I'm not trying to be a downer, but I think it's fair to kind of understand that, you know, as you say, it's a week to week league. It's also it's a league of semantics and strange way of judging. Right. Like the Eagles made the playoffs. Well, two years ago, would this have been a playoff team without the extra seventh seed? 
I don't know. And then therefore, would you be saying this is a team that didn't make the playoffs two straight years? You know, I mean, I, it, because they added a team that made it, a, you know, a more available for a mediocre team to make the playoffs. You may look at this team differently um, just based on that label of playoff team. So I think there's a lot to be determined here. It is a week to week league. And if the Eagles do well and win a playoff game, We'll be talking about what they were able to accomplish in that week and what that might mean for the future. All right. Yeah, I do want to jump back from if the Eagles win a playoff game. Certainly Mm -hmm. a conversation worth having. But this week, Dallas Cowboys coming to town. The coach is committed to nothing as to who's going to play, who's not going to play, who's going to come off COVID, who's not coming off COVID. He probably isn't going to do so till right up until Saturday. Jeff Mosher, you're Nick Sirianni crystal ball. How's this going to be played going into the game against the Cowboys? My crystal ball, uh, my look into the future really requires me to look just back a little bit to training camp, to, you know, shorter practices, to the preseason, nobody playing. I believe this team follows its medical staff um, recommendations as much as any team that really rely leans heavily on either sports science or um, real, you know, um, incorporates the medical staff almost as much as the coaching staff, the way the Eagles have. So I suspect they are going to rest a lot of their starters and um, you know, so that, that will make this game very exciting. So uh, we'll see. And, and by the way, when I say that, you know, you guys know this, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to rest all your starters. Nobody has 10, offensive linemen nobody has like five backup offensive linemen and five backup defensive linemen so uh and you know what the 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 linebacker situation looks like for the Eagles so guys will have to to play a little bit it's not like um you're gonna see a a true preseason game out there with a 75 man roster and you don't sniff a good player on the field but for the most part I don't think this is going to be a very competitive game meaning that the teams are going to be out there really busting their hump to try to win and make it make it mean something all right, Jeff, let me jump in and I'll let you get the next question in. The way you laid it out, which I kind of agree with almost to uh, an exact point, but I got to ask you a question on it. Knowing the game and they're, what they're attempting to achieve, uh, if we're on the same page mentally here, does Jalen Rager play a lot, a little, none whatsoever? Does he fall into the protected player category or the – who gives a you-know-what? We got to get a couple of somebody out there catching passes. How is Jalen Rager's snap count going to end up on Saturday? Somehow I knew this was going to come back to Jalen Rager. <laughs> out of all of this. Uh, I, I, you know, I can't listen. As I sit here now, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I wouldn't be shocked if Jalen Hurts even played a little bit. Um, I no doubt chance. it. But, no but maybe, Does probably not. see not. the field. <laughs> probably not. No, but I think Ray, Jalen Rager – We'll probably play some. Yeah, I would think so. Jeff, you guys do a ton of film breakdown on Inside Birds, and you guys talk about it throughout the year, which one of the reasons why I listen to you guys. So thank you. There's one thing that, you know, we always talk in the preseason, like maybe Eagles are going to break out, surprise you. Who's been the biggest surprising Eagle this year, good or bad? Oh, wow. That's a good question. Um, You know, uh, certainly Jordan Mailata is not someone that we thought or knew, I should say, um, was going to, you know, he obviously the the arrow was pointing up last year, but you didn't realize he was going to come and just really dominate uh, the way he has um, as like a really good cornerstone left, left tackle. So that part to me has been, has been a big and a good surprise. Uh, You know, just in general, the offensive guard play as we stay on the offensive line. I mean, they're, they've been down to like number five and number six at times. So after losing Sayamalu, after losing Brandon Brooks, after, you know, with Landon Dickerson getting a little beat up, um, somebody else has recently gone down whose name, uh, oh, Jack Driscoll. So for the for the way the guards have played, I think that that's been phenomenal. You know, TJ Edwards on defense has made a really big difference in the run game um, and, uh, he, you know, at least stabilized. A lot of their issues that they were having early on when they're when they're linebacker when they were trying to you know trot um, Eric Wilson out there, so uh, the, you know those guys to me have really made a difference. Um, you know you expect the, what you've got from Darius Slay. You expect uh, you know the safeties are 
they're just kind of there. I don't know. You're getting like, you know, great play uh, defensive line. You expect to get things out of sweat. Uh, Barnett, J- Javon Hargrave. Did I see him breaking out for, you know, seven and a half to nine and a half uh, sacks? No, but I mean, he did sign a really big contract. I expected him to be a pretty good player and he started to come on at the end of last year. So I would say that, you know, basically, and I expected Dallas Goddard once this is Zach Ertz trade went through to really kind of step up and be that number one tight end. So I, I, I look at Edwards and Mylotta as the best uh, examples of development right now. Like them both, um, which, oh, by the way, means they shouldn't be playing on Saturday. Both of those <laughs> two guys should be sitting on the side. Edwards might have to. <laughs> um, I, Jeff, uh, doing this for 30 plus years in this town, There are individuals, specifically with the Philadelphia Eagles, you can go in any sport across the board, but specifically the Eagles, who become lightning rod guys, who no matter what the conversation is, you got to get on one side of the fence or the other. Either you're a big fan or you're a big detractor. And one of the guys who's kind of surprisingly, kind of fitting question that Jeff just asked, a surprising lightning rod guy to me is Jonathan Gannon, that People have an opinion on him, and it's pretty strong. Either way, one or the other. Eagles are one of the better statistically ranked defenses in the National Football League. But they don't play aggressive enough like Philadelphia Eagle fans want to see. The Eagles have been really bad in the first half of games this last month and change. But they've been great in the second half of games, and they're shutting teams out. It's the yin and the yang. There seems to be no middle. We know the answer lies somewhere there in the gray of the middle which people don't want to seem to get to with Jonathan Gannon. So my question to you is more good or more bad? <sighs> more good. Um, I, you know, not to, to say that I'm not one of those people, though, who has questioned some of his play calls and decision-making and aggressiveness. I certainly am. It's funny. I actually defended Jonathan Gannon more when they were two and five <laughs> because, I, because I felt that the personnel issues – Ver- that they have and still have um, versus the uh, caliber of opponent they were playing versus the idea that he's just literally getting his feet wet with the team almost should have told you that it was going to be a very difficult start for this team. Um, but I, lately I find myself a little more critical in moments of games. I'll give you a great example. This Washington game they just played. All right. Um, the last drive of the game, Washington starts – backed up in their own territory. First pass is tipped by Milton Williams. Second pass, he's hurried, and he, I mean, Heineke throws it to Wendell Smallwood, and he barely you know, could, could uh, get that pass. It was an incomplete pass. He was rushed. So you got him on third and 10 in their own territory with less than two minutes to go, and they played the softest coverage that you can imagine and gave up the easiest pitch and catch throw from Heineke to the tight end to move the chains, right? And what happens is after that, then they make a few plays and all of a sudden they're trying to throw the ball into the end zone for a chance to win the game there. And I'm not like Jim Johnson or any defensive coordinator, but I know that if you pressure a quarterback on third and 10 with just one extra guy, if you make him throw the ball a little bit quicker than he has to, there's a good chance that even if he completes the pass, the receiver doesn't even have enough time to get past the first down marker. If you do what the Ravens do, and I'm not saying he should have done this, but bring everybody on a cover zero, then he's got to throw the ball immediately, like throw a jump ball up for grabs. And the, the, the percentage of him completing that pass are really, really low, especially compared to the pitch and catch that you gave up on third and 10 there. And it almost came back to bite them. And to be honest with you, when that's Tom Brady instead of, and instead of Taylor Heineke, or Garrett Gilbert, that is going to bite them. And that has bitten them in the past. So I don't think that this guy needs to be fired. I don't think he's the worst thing ever. I think he's as bright as they say he is, but he's certainly timid in certain spots that leave the team vulnerable. Jeff, you kind of, you know, let us segue in my next question here, because I was going to bring up the cover zero thing. I I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I I feel like the Eagles – if they run cover zero, it's very rare this year. Like it might be like maybe 10 or 15%, probably one of the lowest is in the lead. You know, why do do you think it's because of that? Like, again, it's just afraid that to get beat by the big play. Well, I mean, (laughs) it's like violence in movies. Cover zero isn't for everybody, right? Like the Ravens do it like 20 times a game. I know like, I don't think Jim Schwartz ever did a 
a cover zero except for that one time. The Titans game. The yeah, the, no, the Jets game two years ago when Luke Falk started and he blitzed everybody. For, he was blitzing guys from the mezzanine level in that game. So, um, I, But in general, to your point, Jeff, I think that his – and they've stated this. Their whole goal is to limit explosive plays and try to get more than your opponent. And the best way to limit explosive plays – is to have your safeties deep and keep everything in front of you. We saw first seven weeks he was playing so much cover two that it was exhausting watching the Eagles get picked apart across the middle. I credit him. He has changed. He's played more safety in the box, cover one, um, and he's played more man defense, especially on third down. And he has blitzed a little more. And actually this last game against Washington, That's one cool. of the things that they did really well was disguise, you know, uh, everybody moving after the snap and you could see, Heineke had trouble figuring out where to go at times because what he saw after the snap was different than what he saw at the snap. So, and those are all good things, but yeah, he, he is not going, he wants to limit the big plays. So he does want to keep at least one safety deep and that, that will hurt him at times. Uh, I, I predict in the, in the postseason. All right. Uh, Got to ask you about what transpired Monday with this football team. We did our show and John went down to the noble care complex and found out, 12 Eagles had tested positive for the coronavirus, and they were uh, going into protocols after the Eagles had just the previous week through Nick Sirianni stated, you know, we're going above and beyond. There are the protocols, and then there are the Eagle protocols, and that's why we haven't been tremendously affected. Oh, but they got 12 guys positive on Monday, and if they all get out of it by Saturday, they can play them in the game. And then they don't have to have them tested for 90 days. Eagles, it's uh, amazing, Eagles isn't the it? System up. <laughs> well, all I know is because, you know, whatever conspiracy theory you want, I'm fine with it because this team was better than any other team in the league at controlling the outbreak. Then they go and win a game, clinch the division the next day. Every half the teams on the on on the mm-hmm. list. So I can't figure that one out. Next <laughs> field, maybe. What's that? Next field. Perhaps. No, they all got into FedEx Field. <laughs> I didn't even go, think along those lines. Uh, there you I, go. I mean, we're ripping off FedEx Field this week. We might as well do it. Yeah, I did. there you go. So you maybe it was all over. There, Mo. Yeah, they may have sprayed the COVID all over the visiting <laughs> locker room. I just I, I have no idea. <laughs> But it does, as long as everybody's healthy, as long as everyone's asymptomatic um, and that there are no health complications from it, it does benefit them in the fact that going forward, they won't have to worry about any of these guys being on the list for the next like 90 days, which, you know, carries you through the Super Bowl for that big Eagles Super Bowl run. So (laughs) if they had a Super Bowl, I might have to do a Birds 365 show like just me with with my, you know, what, what the, what's the meme with, with like the face in the front or the, the paper face, but you really like, <laughs> That's right. I, 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 I would probably do that because I'll say it right now, the, there's no way the Eagles are going to Super Bowl. It, if they do, you guys can record this and I'll just laugh at it. <laughs> not, not this year, any. Anyway. Not there are going to have to be a lot of Mia Copas from all of us in the, uh, in the media <laughs> and, and, and many people in the fan base if this team goes into the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, it's stranger things have happened in the NFL, but I, I don't know. So, seven seeds this year, uh, you know, even in the AFC, I, I'm not too crazy about where it's the Chargers, the Raiders, the Colts, the Ravens, the, the whoever it might be. But um, I, I want to add this in here. Do you like this expanded playoff format? And to add on to this, do you like the Monday Night Wildcard game? Because we're going to get that this year, too. And the Eagles could play in that. Yeah, uh, I don't mind the Monday night wild card game as much. Um, I don't love the expanded playoffs. I mean, I think it's is it great? Is it extra football? You're asking me as a as a reporter, not as a fan. If I was a, just a fan, I'd be like, yeah, more football, great, awesome. As a reporter, I think hmm, you know you kind of water down um, the product a little bit. And uh, but I understand why they did it. Uh, look at all the the permutations that are still around that might get certain teams into the playoffs and um, you'll probably have fewer teams resting starters this way. Well, they did it for the money. That's not actually why they did it, but by doing what they did, they did create an extra level of excitement for fan bases um, around, around the country. There's no doubt about it. All right, Moshe, uh, uh, this has been discussed with everybody's been on the show the last couple of days, the last couple of nights I've been on WIP. (laughs) <laughs> Eagles have four potential playoff opponents they could be facing next weekend. There we go. <laughs> the Cardinals, 
the Rams, the Bucks, the Cowboys. I'm asking you to put them in a preference order that the Eagles should want to face those teams because they have better chance to beat them than the other teams on the list. So in order, the the preference the Eagles should have in facing the four potential opponents that they've got in the upcoming playoffs. All right. I guess number one, I would say – I'd probably say the Cowboys, number one. They've only beaten one team this year that's above 500. Uh, that was the Patriots. That's earlier in the year. They have not played as well down the stra- down the, the second half. You know, I obviously still would favor the Cowboys in that game. They'd be at home and everything. But, you know, plus it's a division game. They tend to be wacky, uh, you know, so you can hang around a little bit. I, so I would say Cowboys won. Uh, Arizona, number two, uh, because I think you can run the ball against Arizona. Um, I do think the Eagles would be able to to move the chains in that regard against the Arizona defense and – you know, perhaps without DeAndre Hopkins, who I don't think would be back, um, you ca- you might be able to catch Arizona at a time that they're vulnerable. I know they just beat Dallas, but in general, it's not like they played the way they played the first uh, seven or eight weeks. Number three would be the Rams. I think that's a. I think the Rams just have too many weapons. I think they run. I know that they haven't been great, but they run the ball well. That whoever you know, Cooper Cup or. Odell Beckham on Steven Nelson is going to be really difficult. And those tight ends and the way they pick apart the middle of the field uh, would be a nightmare, I think, for the Eagles defense. And then obviously the last team is Tampa, because why would you ever, ever, ever want to play Tom Brady in the postseason ever, ever, ever? Jeff (laughs) Jeff Mosher, football genius. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Believe it or not, I, I Jeff, tell I don't want any part of the Cowboys because I don't like the the X's and O's and the mismatches. But that's oh just- man, give me the give me the Cowboys over Tom Brady any day of the week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Thank you, Jeff Mosher. <laughs> you can't. Believe. I feel like I'm being a pawn here. Was this an argument that you no, guys just had? Uh, oh, Jeff, okay. you got to watch more Birds 365. McMullen, Domowich, um, Franklin, Kerr. Uh, guys on WIP last night, Joe Gillio, um, uh, Ike Reese, they all wanted Tom Brady before they wanted the Dallas Cowboys. I'm telling you, one after the other after the other. I'm the only one sitting here going, have I lost it's my mind? I, I got like up and walked off the show is. yesterday when Domowitz <laughs> said, I'd rather play the, uh, the, the Bucks than the Cowboys. You and I are simpatico, buddy, but I'm <laughs> telling you, we're in the minority. All right. Well, I, I've been on that uh, that island before, so I will die on the hill company. with you, my I'll friend. Take, I'll, go, I'll get the coconuts if we're on the yeah. island. I'll, I'll, I'll wait, work, bud. Y- your boy, Cyril Grayson, he'll be the James Starks of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this year. He will be the James Starks. I, w- I do agree with you on that. Uh, Cyril right. Grayson. I mean, only Tom Brady can make Cyril Grayson a, a household name. Yeah, and, oh, by the way, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen this already. I've said it a couple times at the show. Baird's repeating. 32 different scenarios, the way the playoffs can play out. Kemsky did a great job listing them all on Philly Voice. Mm-hmm. 32 scenarios, 22 of them have the Eagles play in the box. So 60% chance it's going to be against Tampa. Only 5% or 5 potential outcomes that it's the Rams, 4 for the uh, Cardinals, and 2 for the Cowboys. So we're not going to get what we want, which is to face the Cowboys, Jeff. And we're going to get exactly what we don't want, which is chances are it's going to be the Bucks. Well, stranger things give, have give happened. Give me a scenario. As, as much as you and I agree, and we fear and respect Tom Brady, give me a scenario whereby the Eagles beat the Bucks, the, the Buccaneers. Um, Tom, Brady, Tom gets Brady gets hurt before the game. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> now, hey, but you know what? One, to be honest with you, thing, real, real quick, though, real quick, Jeff, I, you know, I, we talk about Tom Brady, but their defense – is good and they have the type of defense that I think and and we already saw it it's it's I don't want to say it's kryptonite for what the Eagles do but they can stop the run they attack the edges really well teams that attack the edges even with secondary players have performed well against the Eagles this year against Jalen Hurts what he does you know the Giants actually have done that they've they've brought safety blitzes a lot from um, from his his uh, his stronger side and kind of kept him in the pocket and made him a thrower. And in those games, both of the games, you know, they lost one. They they you know were struggling in the other. Uh, I just think that they they're the total recipe. And Dallas's defense is a lot improved from last year, but you know, I I, I don't think that, I don't have a high confidence that they would be either team. But I would just rather not play Tampa. 
So here's one for you too, Jeff. You know, we talk, we keep talking about the COVID situation. How's the NFL going to handle it if, lo and behold, the, the golden boy, Tom Brady, tests positive for COVID-19 on the week he plays a playoff game? It's, you know, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories here, but does the NFL try to hide this information from us? Or, like, is he, do they try to do whatever they can to make this guy play? I mean, I, I'm sure they don't want a Sean Mannion, Mike Glennon situation in the postseason. Uh, I'm sure. And in fact, if I were Bruce Arians and the Glazers who own the team, I'd probably be looking into like, you know, space travel for Tom Brady for the next seven or eight days and just get him, get him off the planet. Then, you know, r- return him oh, right. Yeah. A day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Hop on the Bezos rocket, get out of here and then come back like five days before the, uh, the game, the, the playoff game begins. All right. Then uh, we appreciate you coming on, Jeff. I'm going to ask him one more question which I know will annoy football purists out there, but it is what it is. (laughs) Um, Someone did talk about the scenario whereby if the Steelers lose and the Colts lose, the flex to Sunday night game between the Raiders and the Chargers, if they finish in a tie, (laughs) both teams would make the playoffs, which I know is 0.0002% chance of happening. But it's the facts, Jack, and they could come together and go, you know, we could just go out and continue to snap the ball and take knees. And uh, we both uh, move on to the playoffs. Mm -hmm. I'm all for it. It's not going to happen. We know it's not going to happen. But it's not a 0% possibility. There's that smallest percent. I think one of the reasons it won't happen is because Rich Passacci is the coach of the uh, Raiders, and he's a Yonkers guy. Yonkers guy, I'm a Yonkers guy, tough guy. We don't do that. We play. We compete. We get out there. With... How nuts would Goodell go if the, the, the one of the two coaches just kind of leaked that as a possibility leading up to the game? You know, we could act – if someone in a position to potentially make it happen actually said something, what would Goodell's reaction be? That, that's a great question, and I'll tell you this. I'm rooting for it. I I love chaos. I love – and listen, your boy McMullen says it all the time. The, 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 the law of unintended consequences when you open up an extra game and you do – you do what you're doing and you leave these scenarios open. I, I hope it happens. I think it would be fantastic because what, what you're ideally saying is that if both teams just kneeled on every single snap and they finished with a tie, they're in the playoffs. So yes. what, what, like, why would you actually try to win the game or, or, or give yourself a chance to lose the game? I think it's. Get rid of ties if you want to get rid of that scenario. That, that, that'd, yeah. be my, that'd be my thing, but. It's, I, I'm with you, I, but I'm rooting for it. Do <laughs> Sunday, do Sunday night. The final game of the season would come down to tanking, and I'm all for it. It's hey, not, go I go Jaguars people. and go uh, Ravens, right? Because that those are the, that's Pittsburgh's got to lose to Baltimore, and and uh, Jags have to beat the Colts. By the way, here's a crazy fact: you know the Colts have not beaten the Jaguars in Jacksonville since 2014. Oh, even better! How insane is that? <laughs> the Jaguars have stunk for how long, and the Colts can't beat them? I think the Jaguars um, beat the Colts in Week One they last did. year. And I remember, I always use that as an example, why you never recalibrate after one week of like, you know, when the Eagles beat the Falcons in the season opener so badly and everybody's like, whoa, this Eagles team might be amazing. I would say, yeah, the Jags beat the Colts last year in week one. Let's let's all just calm down. You know, I mean, it just it's week one. There's a lot of week one hijinks every year. I'm the all most right, that- man in Houston, Jeff, because I picked the Texans to go one in 16 and they won four games. <laughs> so. Ah, there you go. <laughs> you go. In your eye, Kirk. All right, the last thing, Jeff. Assuming the Eagles pull in the uh, oars and don't necessarily put forth their best effort to win this game because they got a bunch of their top players not even dressed or on the bench mm. and being overwatched by a security guard that they don't go running out onto the field, what is Sirianni attempting to achieve? Once you put the put it in its proper perspective, you still got sixty minutes of football to play, and you can get some things done. What do you think Sirianni's looking to do if we got the right read on it? And priority number one is don't get key guys hurt. What's priority number two? Mm, don't get. I, I'm not even sure in a game like this if there is a priority number two that even comes okay. close to priority number one. I mean, winning is great. It 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 continues your win streak, so it feels good. 
right, to go into the playoffs, it would be on a five game winning streak. But, you know, however, if they lose the game, they're just going to say, well, you know, who cares? No big deal anyway. So it's a real distant number two priority, I say, to try to win the game. All right, you uh, should be checking out their website on a daily basis inside thebirds.com. You catch him on 97.5 once a week with his uh, co-host buddy, Mr. Kaplan, does a great job. And yes, I want to personally thank you for bringing some sanity back here to Birds 365 (laughs) by showing the proper reverence for the GOAT Tom Brady that the Eagles should want no part of who they're probably going to get in about 10 days. But you and I will lament that then. Jeff Motion, thank you very much. Appreciate you coming on board. All right, no problem. And, hey, look, if the Eagles win that game and if the Cowboys or lose that game, the Cowboys go on to win more than we thought, We'll come, I'll come back and give a mea culpa to you guys, all right, or to your audience for saying uh, that. Done deal. <laughs> and let's see, before Xander shrinks the picture, will Mosher re- reach for the Cheerios? I know he's no. dying to. I know he's got the bowl right there. He's ready to go no, to I the Cheerios. Get, I'm about the coffee right now. I need the coffee. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jeff, thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. You Jeff Mosher see, from yeah. Inside the Birds here with us on Birds 365. All right, uh, Jeff Kerr, Johnny McDonald. We still got no oh, about seven or eight minutes left to go. Come back as we put a bow on the show here on Birds 365. This is Joe Krause of Krause's Coats inviting you to donate a slightly worn coat or jacket and help veterans stay warm this winter. Go to Krause's Coats on Facebook to help those who've served. Have a happy holiday. At Stateside Vodka, every new customer gets the world's best rocks glass, free. What's that? Uh, a rocks glass? You're telling me that bottle is cut in half? You could say that. Holy shit. And you're telling me I can get one of these glasses for free? That's right. One free rocks glass per customer with each first-time purchase of Stateside Vodka. So good, it just disappears. The city of Philadelphia sparkles during the Christmas holiday season with an array of colorful light displays and illuminated Christmas trees donated or installed for free by the talented electricians of IBEW Local 98. To learn more about who we are, what we do, and career opportunities at IBEW Local 98, visit us at www.ibew98.org. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. As a hardworking American, you've never experienced how tough life can be until now. A catastrophic injury while working on the job. A personal injury from someone else's negligence. Turned away by other law firms in the region who didn't bother to learn your story. It's time to meet the Fritz and Beyond Cooley Law Firm and managing partner Brian Fritz. Badly injured? Call the Fritz and Beyond Cooley Law Firm. Find out why they say, we got this. Go for the midnight dares. Go for the game. Go for the hits. Go for the fans. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. Coming back to put the bow on the show that is Birds 365. Jeff Curran for John McMullen. Uh, JM will be up back the bow. COVID test permitting. He better not test positive. 
because otherwise I'm going to be so mad at myself that I did jinx them. But I'm sorry for the show. You got to keep it real. And the Eagles, uh, I think, did game the system to get a bunch of positive COVID tests. But they really shouldn't do that to McMullen this week because he's kissing Howie Roseman's rear end, calling a top five general manager in the NFL. He should be put in the protocol whereby you don't have to test again for the rest of the year, John. You can do that for Howie, buddy. Yeah, you don't have to test. It's going to change anyway. You know, his perfect Justin Tucker record's on the line right now. Yeah, we'll see if that uh, works out for McMullen. And thank Jeff Mosher for hopping on board. Glad to hear there's at least one other somewhat knowledgeable, and I'm talking about myself, Jeff Mosher, very knowledgeable football guy who understands Tom Brady is the greatest of all time, and you should pay him his proper respect and not put the Dallas Cowboys ahead of his team in ranking the squads that the Eagles would have the toughest time beating. And one of the things that I continue to harp on, anybody made the argument, oh, you don't want any part of Dallas, playoff uh, experience. The Bucs have it in droves because they went to the Super Bowl, went 4-0 and last year, won a championship. Oh, by the way, Brady and Gronkowski have like decades of Super Bowl and playoff experience, which the Dallas Cowboys have none. I mentioned Greg the Leg earlier as maybe their most uh, uh, playoff uh, history guy. Do you know who's the second most accomplished playoff performer on the Dallas Cowboy roster? In Jeff- terms of the- in terms of experience or uh, in terms of experience and at least making one really big play in his uh, playoff history. His playoff is, man. Oh, this is tough. I mean, I'll because... give you a hint. 2017. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, step on. No, not Diggs. Um... I'll give you another hint. <laughs> Super Bowl Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah, Corey Clement. Yeah, Corey I, Clement, I, yes! I, I, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, no, it's not my big thing on the couch. I'm thinking his brother, and I'm like, well, no, it couldn't have been him. And I'm thinking, like, in terms of experience, I'm, you know, Amari Cooper's been in the playoffs twice, but... Right, and... Uh, yeah, they, didn't win. Win. They, they didn't win. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, no, the Cowboys got a couple guys. Dak and uh, Zeke have been there a couple times. No major uh, successes in the postseason. Corey Clement does with the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah, he, he gets that uh, little nod for uh, playoff experience, uh, which would just bug the heck out of Philadelphia fans. If he somehow got into a game and made a play against the Eagles, it would uh, drive them all absolutely crazy, which is not what Eagle fans want to see. And then chances are they're not going to play the Cowboys anyway. Because if the Eagles get the Bucs, they somehow – Miracle of miracles. They beat the Bucks. They're going to have to go to Green Bay the week after. Uh, yeah, that's going to be pretty tough to beat Mr. Rogers in his neighborhood on the frozen tundra of Lambeau Field. But then if they do that, they get to go down to Dallas and take on the Cowboys. And we're, we're assuming Dallas gets this far. Nice you know that, right? the Eagles. We're assuming Dallas gets this far here. I mean, Dallas hasn't been to an NFC Championship game since I was seven. True. And the Eagles have been to a championship game much more recently than that 2017 uh, playing against the Vikings, which is one of the best beatdowns in Eagles history. All right, uh, Jeff, I you pretty much said it, but I'll give you one last, last chance to uh, confirm. You don't think the Eagles are going to go all out to win this game, that they will absolutely be conservative and Put as a priority, that's what I used last segment with uh, Mosher, and I'll repeat it here. The priority of this game this week is keep your best players healthy, correct? Oh, yeah. Like Mosher pointed out basically the same thing I, I was going to mention that, you know, when you asked me this question earlier. It's pretty much – look what they did in the preseason. They didn't play anybody. They – this is a meaningless game for them, the six seed, seven seed – does it matter? Like, I mean, they could back into the six seed anyway, just because if somehow the 49ers, would, uh, I mean, the 49ers can lose to the Rams. There's no doubt about that. But the Saints beat, I don't know, the Saints play Falcons? I think it's yes. I think the Falcons. Okay. So, yeah, then they would get the six seed anyway. Again, they can't control anything. So you might as well just rest your guys. Give yourselves an extra week. It's either them or the Cowboys are going to play the Saturday night wildcard game. I, I have a feeling it's going to be the Cowboys. That's why they kind of did this whole Let's play Eagles Cowboys on Saturday night. Then the Cowboys get the full week, et cetera. And it actually kind of helps the Eagles because the Eagles might not play on Saturday now. They might play on on a Sunday and they'll get that extra day rest. So wh- why not? You don't you don't gain anything. Okay, ten win season, big deal. You know, it's like 
the one year the Eagles went 11 five, and you know they, they won like that meaningless game. I think they started AJ Feely against Tampa Bay, and they they ended up playing Tampa Bay the next week anyway and crushed them. So yeah, it's I, I wouldn't play anybody. The only thing that's bumming me out about this game coming up against the uh, Cowboys, which we have the right read protecting uh, their star players are the number one priority. We don't have Nate Sudfeld to put into the game this year against the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, we because have Reed Stinnett. He can do it. What? Reed Stinnett, the third string quarterback, he can come in. So Jeff Lloyd, what was the word that he used to describe Sudfeld oh. last year? Oh my God, yeah. Dangerous, or it was just a word that that, that just jumped out at me. Say, what? What did you say? Did yeah, you just call Nate Sudfeld last? I remember this. I'm like, Nate Sudfeld. So am I, and I can't remember what it was. The dangerous, the awesome. Ah, oh, God damn it. I, I, should re- I should remember this because it should be like in quarter. it should be like his quarterback factory. But maybe right. where, where, are, where are our streamers? Because every once in a while I'll get a stream on a guy and go, hey, Jody, why don't you inter- interact with the stream more often? And I know you guys are good and thank you very much for listening and liking and everything else. And I'll say this, you entertain me on a day-in, day-out basis with some of the things that you say, but uh, we we don't want to dedicate the show to the stream. I'm just waiting for one of the streamers who remember the exact word that Jeff Lurie used to describe Nate Sudfeld after the Eagles had tanked away the final game of the season. Yeah, and they can deny it all they want and say... Uh, uh, Jeff Lurie, in attempt to defend the Eagles' actions in last week, last year's last game, Referred to Nate Sudfeld with a specific uh, adjective. Unstoppable. That's the unstoppable. There we go, Jeff Kerr. Good job out of you. Came. Did you get it off the stream? Did somebody? Think yeah, it was- uh, Z- Xander put it out. Oh, Xander. Xander. Oh, <laughs> I'm 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 trying to give the stream guys a chance to come up big. I should have known Xander would come up big. Good job, Xander. Very good. Uh, they, the unstoppable Nate Sudfeld will not be coming into the game. For the you know my favorite part about all this? And again, this is why I hope Joe Judge coaches the New York Giants forever for all eternity because he got so bent out of shape over that. His 6-10 and 10 football team, so bent out of shape because of what the Eagles did. And now he's going off against Washington. We all fight on the sidelines and we play hard. I'm like, that's great, dude. Your, your team sucks. I don't and know then, how he's lost to that. And I know, by the way, I did see this on a tweet. After he did that, took a couple verbal shots at Washington, then decided to take the pass on doing the media sit down with the other team's uh, media guys. It's become optional this year. It used to be mandatory. Now it's optional. Oh, by the way, Nick Sirianni has done it every week this year. Joe Judd said, yeah, I think I'll pass. I'll take pot shots at Washington, and then I won't face the music against the media. So Uh, your pot shots against Joe Judge are well-placed, Jeff Kerr. I think a lot of our streamers know the movie, Heavyweights. It's Joe Judge sits after the – uh, after all the kids at, at, at the overweight camp, they, they, they're all heavier than what they came in. Joe Judge goes to the back and goes, it's not my fault. It's their fault. It's their fault. It's your fault, and you will pay. And that that's Joe Judge. It's never my fault. It's everybody else's fault. All right, Jeff Carr, good job out of you today. Thank you very much for stepping in. Appreciate it whenever you do. Uh, we'll get you back soon enough, bud. Thanks. Uh, always a pleasure, Jody. Uh, you know, it's been a crazy couple weeks here, but, you know, Football's got me through it, so I'll say that. And we'll also stop, uh, thank the unstoppable Jeff Mosher for coming on and realizing the Dallas Cowboys are beatable and the Tampa Bay Bucks may not be. Good job out of most, too. Uh, Johnny Mac scheduled to be back, COVID test uh, permitting tomorrow. We're the countdown to another Eagles Cowboy matchup and the Eagles playoffs 22 hours from now. We're back here on Birds 365. If you missed any of today's show on the Jacob Media channel, listen to the podcast on your way home. Available on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify.